Well, good morning. We're going to have a time here. Uh, I, I have spent, this is, didn't really start off as kind of a message. Uh, I had seen a testimony on a public forum, uh, and the testimony was based around a, a woman's sobriety, sobriety. And uh, it, it really struck me, just her testimony, and the fact that she was in a public forum, uh, it was on a business forum uh, called LinkedIn. Some of you may be connected to that here or there, but uh, she was giving praise to God, and uh, it was quite amazing. So I just struck up a little bit of a word study on the word sobriety and what the Bible had to say about it. The interesting thing uh, about that is, you know, the root word being sober which is used quite a bit. Paul, Peter, uh, James, a number of them use that word in the text that we have. But the word sobriety really didn't become a word until like the 15th century in Middle Europe. And, um, and we see that used in the King James Version, which was written in 1611. Uh, so we do see the word sobriety in the Bible a couple different places, uh, but, but really, uh, my little title, Becky always asked me, well, what's the title? What's the title of this message going to be? So when it's recorded or what have you, she has a, a name to attach to it. So the word sobriety, as I studied through that and looked at what Paul and Peter and all had to say about being sober, it occurred to me, well, how do we how do we get to that place? And it comes through submission. So that title is Sobriety and Submission. So that's a little introduction to what we're going to talk about today. But I, I did want to mention, uh, I'm going to be teaching on the prophetic word, or uh, let me say that a little differently, the fundamentals of prophecy within the church, kind of a foundation and we're going to be doing that on Wednesday nights. We haven't set the date. And it may be two or three weeks of just studying what the Word says about prophecy within the church setting, how it functions, who functions in it, who receives, uh, all the critical issues to really understand what the Bible has to say about that. Following that fundamental teaching, we may uh, launch into, we, we have a couple of folks here that operate in the prophetic, and we may, you know, we haven't really worked this out yet, but we may like to do some of that, let them share a little bit about how God has gifted them and how he speaks to them and reveals himself in different ways. And um, uh, I was just sharing with my father, uh, my, my, my dad, my daddy, uh, just the other day as I was reading through some of the uh, narrative on this teaching, and uh, we were talking about prophecy in the church, and, and uh, I said, you know, I'm, I don't really see myself as a prophet, but there have been times over the years when I'd be in an individual conversation with someone, and we would just, and I would be sharing and, you know, really pouring out my heart into their life and trying to speak truth, and, and then when I, you know, at some point I'd go, well, I, I think I just prophesied. I think I just prophesied over that person. You know, I think that that happens to all of us when you're operating within the Spirit of the Lord and you're, uh, you're, you're actually being led. There's times when, you know, God provides the Word. It could be a spontaneous conversation come up, and all of a sudden you're talking to somebody about getting saved, you know, about, about what God is doing in their life. And I think that's how God works through us. And I think a lot of us, a lot of us prophesy when we don't realize what we're doing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, let me share a couple of other things uh, just just for fun. I have a letter here from the Pope, and uh, the the Pope writes me quite often. I'm just well, he's, it starts off, my dearest Alonzo. I'm concerned about your salvation. 
and I wanted to share this word. He didn't write all that part. But actually, I do. From a, a good brother, I call him my brother because whenever I, uh, I work with this gentleman, <clears throat> hardcore Catholic, and when we're in conversations and things like that and we talk about what God's doing within the community and so forth, I'll say something like that. Well, you know, if I make some kind of a comment and it says it includes Catholics and Christians, he, he will stop me. Don't forget Catholics are Christians too. You know, because somehow we try to separate all these different, uh, and forgive me for, for doing that, but so I receive through him, he forwards it to me, the Missouri Catholic Conference weekly newsletter, which is really, uh, and they do a great job of keeping their rather large community uh, aware of what's going on politically and how it affects the Christian body. Uh, you know, reform in uh, abortion, um, LGBT, prison, uh, execution, you know, in the state, uh, social issues, uh, caring for people, uh, just a number of things that they talk about in legislation that has an impact on our community, the Christian community. And so I received that. And recently, during this time, uh, the pandemic issue that we're, we're still going through, the Pope, Pope Francis, has actually started about weekly or every so many days He'll write just a little piece, and that comes out in a little a, a quote, a statement from the Pope. And uh, I had this one, and I printed it off, and I wanted to share it with you. It's, it's a common word, but the Pope is very clear with his punctuation and the way he says things. And you've heard me speak a little bit before about the time that we spend in the Bible and the Word how it really is a personal letter to each one of us, is it was written to you. And every phrase, every comment, every punctuation is very specific. And when you read the Bible, if you take the time to break down every phrase and read it as if you were reading a book to a child, how you emphasize and you pause and you change the inflection in your voice. Make it be impactful as you read it personally. The Pope does the same thing when he writes, and I'll, I'll try not to read as if I'm reading to a young person, but um, this is the, the parable of the sower is somewhat the mother of all parables because it speaks about listening to the word. It reminds us that the Word of God is a seed which in itself is fruitful and effective, and God scatters it everywhere, paying no mind to waste. Such is the heart of God. Each one of us is ground on which seed of the Word falls. No one is excluded. The Word is given to each one of us, we can ask ourselves, what type of terrain am I? Do I resemble the path, the rocky ground, the bramble bush? But if we want, we can become, become good soil, plowed and carefully cultivated to help ripen the seed of the word. It is already present in our heart, but making it fruitful depends on us. It depends on the embrace that we reserve for this seed. Pope Francis. I thought it was quite Quite interesting, his choice of words and the way he commas, colons, periods. I, I hope that I expressed that clearly so that you could get the real meaning of what he was trying to say there. Uh, anyway, I, I did jump right into this. I, I wanted to share, uh, I know you thought it was a little funny when I, when I uh, mentioned I had a letter from the Pope. 
really wasn't meant to be funny. The funny part is, I don't know if, if you've noticed the grooming that I did this morning. Can you tell? It's bacon grease. I noticed some of you men were kind of drawn in real close to me. That's what it is. It's bacon grease. So, just wanted to share that. Like, that was really important. Um, so, anyway, let's go ahead and launch into, sir, you wanted some bacon? They did. And one rooster. Uh, but my message is, as you, a, a number of you, and we have a, a fairly small crowd, which I feel real comfortable with, uh, large crowds seem to make me get weird. <laughs> but uh, for those of you, you know my messages are, you know, even though the content changes, my message is always the same. And I try to keep them succinct, to the point, Claire, but I, I ramble off sometimes. I did this at home. There's I don't know, 19 or 20 pages of notes here. And I did this in about 17 minutes at home with no other interaction. So it's just shortly before 11. We'll see if we can be out of here by 1, close, close to 1 o'clock or so. But um, the root of the message is fall in love with Jesus. And, and in that, let your spiritual gifts overflow in you. Be a part of what he is doing. Be connected. It used to be, we were, I was just talking uh, with another young man, and uh, it used to be churches were all open every Wednesday night, every Sunday night, and you were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and Friday night, and if you had a special speaker, you were there maybe every night of the week because there was a revival going on. It seems like many of us that grew up in that culture have even bought into, we do church once a week, it's Sunday morning. And that's all that's really necessary. I'm going to hopefully ask us all to check ourselves on that. I'm just going to share a word that's in my heart. If the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, you can come up and give me a hug later anyway. Some of the messages I've shared in the past were, the little titles were love and liar, love and liar, four-letter words. You remember that comment? Four-letter words. I'm going to be speaking on four-letter words this morning, love and liar. And it was really about 1 John chapter 2. Uh, 1 John was, early in my salvation, was one of the most powerful because it was so straightforward. In 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to paraphrase, says, if you say you obey his commands, or if you say you love God, yet you do not obey his commands, you're a liar. But if you love God, then you will do his commands. And you must walk as Jesus walked. That's uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, I think, somewhere in the ballpark. Also, uh, a few months back, I did a, a short little thing that was really impacting me. In his image, Genesis chapter 1, we were made in his image, in his likeness, to have dominion over this earth. But are we really walking in his image and in his likeness? My messages are always pretty much the same. When you, when you boil it right down, so I'm going to be talking about sobriety and submission this morning. The, the uh, actual definition of sobriety is really 
the common day, when you hear the word sobriety today, it's kind of like it's associated with, you know, a 12-step program and uh, AA, which is wonderful, or Celebrate Recovery, the faith-based organization that does the same thing. It's helping people escape from their addictions to become sober. To become sober is, well, there's a number that, you know, uh, synonyms and, and different things. To be earnest, to be grave, to be wise-minded, to be mindful. Uh, I make wise decisions. Being sober, and that's the way it's used largely in the Bible, is defining different attributes that we should have. Um, today's definition of sobriety is mostly associated with even the, the term emotional sobriety. Emotional sobriety is not being uh, a victim of your feelings and your emotions. That's part of today's it used to be when I was a kid, and, and I, maybe I got it wrong, uh, but I've shared this before. The word anxious, if you use the word today anxious, or if you say, I'm feeling a little anxious, uh, and, you know, some people may deal with anxiety, and there are a number of different um, treatments for that that our medical professionals have deemed, you know, necessary. And it, it is real in some people, but for me growing up, when I said I was anxious, I was just excited about something. It's amazing how words have changed their use and their meaning over the years. Uh, I'm always anxious. I, I get excited about a lot of different things. But uh, sobriety is coming to the same way, or being sober has taken on a different meaning. So I want us to make sure that we stay focused on what being sober is. It's an attribute that we should attain for ourselves to walk with the Lord, to be single-minded, to be focused, to be earnest and grave, intentional about everything we do. Because sobriety, as used today, which we need to key in on, is really about addictions. It's about having hang-ups. It's about, not that any of us in this room do, but, you know, some people struggle with different issues that they seem to be uh, stuck on. You know, I... I'm sure I have some. My wife will gladly tell you what they are, but um, I won't volunteer. I'm just going to mention a few. Life being influenced by external circumstances or events or thoughts. What consumes your thoughts? What consumes your day? You know, the plain fact is the things that are important to us, those are the things we do. The things that are in your heart is what you give yourself to. So the fruit of your life is pretty much shows, doesn't it? I mean, people just, I'm sure we've all said, I don't see any fruit in his life, because what you see is other kinds of fruit. And when you use that term, I don't see any fruit in his life, you mean you don't see spiritual fruit because you see other things going on. It's kind of evidence that that person has other things that influence their life. They haven't made it to sobriety yet. You know, and what are some of those things that we all deal with? I mean, I'll give a list of a number of things just so we can pick and... Don't anybody raise your hand. (laughs) But you could pick and choose if maybe one of these is, and I wrote a number of them down, TV, food, 
Candy Crush, CNN, ESPN, Facebook, maybe even work, laziness, gossip, going to the lake, not showing up at, at church because the cabin's awaiting you. Video games, Xbox, all that stuff. It's just stuff. But what do we give ourselves to? What is really in your heart will bear fruit. I'm just talking in general and saying a lot of factual truths. It's not like all of these items are sin. None of them really are sin. But what consumes our time? What do we really give ourselves to? Back to the biblical use or definition of the word sober, a serious state of mind, solemn, serious-mindedness, grave, intentional, earnest. Now, you can be those things about a lot of different... You could be that about work. You could be sober about TV or your favorite chair. I have a favorite couch. Now I'm confessing. And it's usually Sunday afternoon when pro golf is on, I get some of my best naps. Sunday afternoon naps. That's a weakness of mine, isn't it, honey? A weakness of mine? It's like, a, it's like an old Assembly of God thing. For, for, I, that's, I grew up in an Assembly of God. And uh, that was just normal. There was always a big lunch on Sunday afternoon and sometimes some visitors and then a nap. Your visitors didn't stay around long if they were from church because they had to get home and take a nap too. Well, anyway, true story, isn't it? How many, you can be honest about it. How many relate to that? Oh, not very many. Can we take a vote? Let's get into some of the word. Paul writes um, all the epistles to all the different churches that he wrote, the letters going out to the Corinthians and the Colossians and, and the Ephesians and Galatians and so forth, all the cities that he ministered to. And in a, in a number of different ways, um, he chose this word, and it, it repeats itself over and over, and a couple of other writers use it as well, and it's a good choice of word. Um, now, you won't find the word sober in the NIV or NASB or some of the other versions, but in the, in the King James, and I had to go uh, rustle up a King James. I usually use my NIV. I had to go rustle up a King James because I wanted to read exactly what it said. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, I'm going to start with 13. I, there were whole sections that I wanted to read, but... Uh, this is uh, the, the church of Corinth, and it's the, the Paul talking to them and saying, for, for whether we be outside of ourselves, and in the NIV, what that says is, whether we be out of our mind or we be sober. So I, I just wanted to give you some context for how that, how that word, you're out of your mind or you're sober. You're in your right mind. The, the point Paul was trying to make is, you know, whether they were earnest for the cause of Christ. 
2 Corinthians, it was chapter 5 and verse 13. Now, to Timothy, uh, a number of things, but the word in Timothy was in Colossians, and I'm going to read some out of Colossians as well, but um, in Timothy, Paul was talking about uh, the elders and the bishops and the word that they uh, used to describe them so that they understood how important that position was. Also, not only were the bishops and deacons and those that he was describing there, uh, that's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 through 11, 2 through 11. Uh, he also talks about their, uh, uh, their wives in several, several places maintaining the same standard. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant. And, and, and again, Paul, and again, let me make sure I'm careful about the way I read this, comma after comma after comma, making very clear that you look at each word, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So he goes on the word sober there. It's, it's quite the definition of how a bishop or a deacon should act. Now, our goal is that we all achieve that in our servanthood. I don't want to read that because it only pertains to bishops or deacons. Is that not the call to all of us? It goes on to talk about the deacons, the bishop, the deacons, and, and so on. Um, but the choice, we have verse 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. It goes on to list all these things out for men and women of good standing in the church of the day. Sober being repeated over and over. I encourage you to arrive at this study. Um, I kind of took the long way around coming through a, a common day plague that many people, the, the issue of sobriety that brought me to what the Bible had to say about being sober and it's really a little different than what we use today. And I want to make sure that we make that very clear. Being sober, let me, let me flip on over here to, to Titus, another description. Titus in chapter 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. And, and verse 6, the young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, so it wasn't just for the leadership in the church. Here they're talking about that the aged men and women are mature Christians would take the young men and women 
and draw them in for teaching on how to be in good standing in the church, being sober, being sober-minded. Now, that was in Titus. Also, Peter takes up the word. James takes up the word, uses it in different places. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 I like this one. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Chapter 1, starting in verse 13 of 1 Peter. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Strengthen your mind. Strengthen the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a little wordy. <clears throat> Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is being brought to you through the knowledge of Jesus. It's the teaching that you're being giving, given under <clears throat> the church body. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is being brought to you at the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As obedient, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, after getting through some of that and reading the different passages that included the word sober, it became very clear to me you know, the purpose of that word. And the question then brought me over to, how do we attain that? How do we get there? That's what took me to the word submission. And things just uh, really over several weeks, it, it wasn't like all of a sudden I had an epiphany or a prophetic word or a word of knowledge. It wasn't like, I heard someone give their testimony. The word sobriety struck me. It took me into a word study. And as I went through sobriety, more questions popped up about the word sobriety and sober. <clears throat> Led me to being submitted. Being submitted. Submission. It's a wrestling move or some people would call it wrestling. It's not really. It could be a good choke out. But uh, the definition as we know it today, or as even used in the Bible, accepting or yielding to the will, I want you to remember that word, the will, or authority of another. Now, it makes it kind of sound like it's a requirement. And we're going to go through that in a little bit more detail. It's about putting others before yourself. It's probably not getting to do everything that you always want to do. And in the case of our context today, it's about putting God's desires in His Word ahead of your desires. Romans 13. Verse 
Well, I'll just, uh, we, could, we could go to read that whole passage, but it's uh, Paul telling the church in Romans that submit to authority. The governor, the leadership, submit to authority, the authority of the land. We have a responsibility to submit to our, our uh, government. They're our leadership. And, and you, you probably saw me, I, when I used the word, I think I was describing, and I caught myself, my facial, I'm fairly animated sometimes. Uh, I don't even say things. Sometimes I look a certain way and my wife goes, what was that for? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> but f things jump off my face sometimes, and I think I did that when I was describing this letter from the Pope, and I mentioned during the pandemic, and I went like that. And, um, you know, that's really not right of me to do that. It is a real thing, and people are being affected by it. And I think our government is doing the best they can. Our local and federal government is doing the best they can to try and protect us and our children. And uh, I shouldn't be so flippant about the pandemic. I'll try to do better. It, you know, I get my temperature taken every morning when I walk into the plant. We, everyone in the plant has to walk through the front door office now. And we have a guy come in early or a young woman come in early every morning. We get our temperature taken with a laser on the forehead, and then we actually have our mask on before we even go into the foyer. <clears throat> so I do it every day. I have to comply, and um, I'll try not to look so with my face all weird about it or the tone of my voice. But uh, we are responsible to submit to the authorities of our land and obey the laws of the land. We're called to that. Being submitted to leadership, to someone we love, It's a joy to submit to someone that you love. Let me get into one. <clears throat> I'll tell you why I go there. <clears throat> Ephesians 5.21. There's a whole, whole lot of different references in the Bible about submitting. Ephesians 5.21 says submit to one to another. Submit to each other. I, I know some of you are looking that up. And then 5.22 one of the most widely misused, misinterpreted, misunderstood verses is wives submit to your husband. A couple of verses later in verse 25 says, husbands, love your wives the four-letter word Love your wives as Christ. Love the church. And he gave himself completely. It's a real deal, husbands. Men. We're the first ones in line because we're men they don't even like the word submit. Tell me I'm wrong about that. And I'll leg wrestle you.
This passage was a teaching to us. Husbands, men, about the beautiful picture of what Jesus did. It isn't about verse 22, making sure that our wives submit. It's about verse 25 and 26. It's for the men. Being submitted Let me get over to Colossians. I, I got to do this one. Colossians. Where is Colossians? It's a little small book there. Uh, I like the way that Paul does it here because he changes the words a little bit. Let's read, let's read that section, ladies. Let's read it out. No, I'm just kidding. We won't read it out loud. Colossians in verse three, or chapter 3, verse 18. Pay attention to the way Paul wrote the very same thing. He was now speaking to the church at Colossus, right? Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. As it is fit in the Lord. So if it's not fit in the Lord, wives, don't submit yourself to your husbands. A wife submits to her husband willingly and lovingly when he's submitted to the Holy Spirit. When he's serving God with all of his heart every day and not being consumed by other things in his life that take up his time and fill his heart. He's a sober man. He's sober-minded. He's got his head screwed on straight. That's when the wife submits. I want to read more of that Colossians. I'm going to start back at verse 11. This is chapter 3, verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. There's a lot of commas there. There's a, a lot of emphasis on a lot of words. Pay attention to what you're reading. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, you also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity. And what does Paul mean when he says charity? It's the four-letter word. 
It's love. I hope we don't just toss that word around. Four-letter words are not meant to be just tossed around. That's a serious word. You know the commercial, I love you, man, it's from years ago. I don't even remember what that was all about. Well, it was a beer commercial? Who said that? Thanks. Yeah, true. I really, uh, you know, hate is a four-letter word. And I really try not to, to use that at all. And I really try not to use the love word without that person really understanding. When I say that, it's very important. See how I got off there on a little tangent? Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, ye, ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves Unto your own husbands, as is fit as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is the well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Ser servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. Amen. I can't emphasize this submitting enough. Being submitted to the Holy Spirit and sensitive and walking with Jesus is the only way to be sober-minded, to be sober and live in sobriety, free from other things filling your heart. And gentlemen, I, I do know, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a phrase I heard years ago. It's, this is certainly not mine. Um, Listen close. You can put whatever words you want in there, guys, to make it fit you, because it needs to. If you want the wife that you think you always deserved, become the husband that she has always dreamed of. I've always loved that little 
phrase. I don't remember where it came from exactly, but it stuck with me. It's a bit of a challenge, gentlemen. But that's what we're called to do, be submitted one to another. It's not just at home, it's here within the body. It starts by being submitted to the Holy Spirit, submitted to the Father. You know, submission is not, in a biblical sense, it's not oppressive. It's not required. It's something that you want to do because I love you. Love. Love. Because I want to do it. Because love is real in me. I've been filled with the Spirit. This becomes natural. The fruit of the Spirit pours out because the Holy Spirit lives in you when you're submitted. Who was that best example of being submitted? Who was that, that perfect picture? Unto death. I could never get up here and share my heart with you guys without just losing it every time. In the garden, and again, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't have it memorized. Forgive me. But Jesus said, Father, Please take this cup from me. Even though, not my will, but your will be done. Knowing he was given his life, he he was submitted. I want us to be submitted to each other, to our church, to our community. It starts by knowing Jesus, being submitted to Jesus. Let him, because you love him so much, because of what he did, Let him fill your heart. Choose to submit. In everything that you do. I know this, this house is, we're full of Christians here. We have a visitor today that joined us that I got to meet in the foyer, but I just felt connected to his spirit. So I feel comfortable in saying that, you know, this house is filled with Christians today. But we're going to start some worship time some ministry time. We're going to finish up. And if there is anyone that feels that need to pray or be prayed with, myself and I'm sure Scott and Steve or anyone who you feel like responding to the altar you want someone to pray with you, we'll make ourselves available. Okay, let's have some worship time. Just spend some time with the Lord. Listen to him. Let him speak to you. 
Let him love on you. I love each one of you. Let's go ahead and have some worship time.